Okay, so we are now starting our final module of the semester. We have something like six to eight lectures left, depending on like class time that we're going to spend doing like presentations and things like that. Um, so this final module is all about the dorsal gradient. We're doing the dorsal gradient because um, that is something that I've done a lot of study of, and um, I feel like I can teach it from a unique perspective, and so uh, we're gonna we're gonna go over it from kind of from the beginning of when we started to be able to to measure it um, up until now when we realize wait a second actually when you actually can measure something quantitatively it allows you to to like discover new things about it it's not just like you, you know in physics let's measure the speed of light to the next decimal place I mean people do that and that's important to them and it's important to physics. Um, biologists probably wouldn't necessarily be interested in that sort of thing, unless it gave you new insight into what could be happening biologically in the system. And what we found is when we were able to actually go from just like looking at pictures of the dorsal gradient to actually measuring it quantitatively, we learned a lot, new th a lot of new things about it. And this has been the case for basically every single other signaling pathway or you know, biological system that we've decided that we should measure quantitatively. We've learned new things about biology, so that's been fantastic. Okay, so you've already learned about the dorsal gradient. We've talked about the dorsal gradient in like three or four different lectures in here in the past. Um, we're gonna do just a, a quick overview uh, to remember that. So um, what you're looking at here is a cross section of a fly embryo. Um, you, it's been immunostained for dorsal. So uh, this brightness down there on that side of the embryo, that's dorsal protein that's in the nuclei. These nuclei are all located on the periphery of the embryo, the surface of the embryo. So it's, it's kind of hard to see, but they're little individual like ball-like structures, little circles here as you go around the embryo. Those are the nuclei. Um, everything here in this black center is yolk, and so that's not where any of the transcription, translation, signaling uh, is happening. It's all happening on the surface. Now dorsal is named backwards. Um, as many fruit fly genes are named backwards, because this up here is the dorsal side, dorsal side of the embryo. And on the part of the embryo where dorsal, the protein, is present, that's the ventral side. So dorsal protein is present on the ventral side, it's absent on the dorsal side. It's named backwards, uh, because it's named for what happens when you take the, the gene away. Dorsal is a morphogen, and so it sets up different domains of gene expression, a high threshold domain, or what we call type 1 genes down here on the ventral side, uh, marked by this gene here in red called snail. You have uh, type 2 genes, which are this dark blue here, for example, V and D. You have type 3 plus genes, which are activated by dorsal and have boundaries right at about 50% of the way around the embryo. And you have type 3 minus genes, which are repressed by dorsal, and they are restricted to the dorsal half of the embryo, like TPP here. Okay, so SOG, uh, which is shown here in green, is an example of a type 3 plus gene, and DPP here in yellow is an example of a type 3 minus gene. And they both have boundaries that are, if I just mark kind of 50% max here, they both have boundaries that are past 40% of the embryo. SOG is right about 50%. DPP is more like 60%. SOG is 45% maybe, I don't know, uh, somewhere in that range. Uh, but those are, are called type 3 genes, and they're either, they're either plus, type 3 plus genes, or type 3 minus genes. Okay, so note also at this stage of embryogenesis, the embryo is a syncytium, which means it's, uh, it's, a, it's a single cell with many different nuclei in it. Right? So the, the nuclei, uh, at fertilization you have one nucleus, and that nucleus divides many times, and eventually you have hundreds of nuclei in the embryo. Um, at some point, during what we call nuclear cycle 10, the nuclei, most of the nuclei migrate to the periphery. That's when they end up on the surface. And they continue to divide there until you get to nuclear cycle 14, which is the longest nuclear cycle. It's the one right before you have all these complex cellular movements on top of each other, uh, right before or during the phase in which these cell membranes are growing in to close off the nuclei, to go from one cell with 6,000 nuclei to an embryo with 6,000 cells. Um, and that's a process called cellularization. Um, so before cellularization happens, this is a syncytium. That means one cell, many nuclei. Um, then cellularization happens, and all of a sudden you have 6,000 cells. 
A lot of this, a lot of the, the important patterning is taking place during nuclear cycle 14. As you can see, it's the longest nuclear cycle of the previous ones. Before nuclear cycle 13, 12, 10 to 12 minutes was the longest nuclear cycle uh, present. And then you have a 20-minute nuclear cycle, which is about double most of the previous ones. And then you have a 45-minute nuclear cycle after that, right before, again, these complex tissue movements where the, the cells start migrating on top of each other in a process called gastrulation. Okay, so like a lot of the, the, the images I'll show today are nuclear cycle 14 images. So for example, this here is a nuclear cycle 14 embryo. These quantifications of the gene expression domains, they are from many images of nuclear cycle 14 embryos. Uh, so this is like nuclear cycle 14 is when like a lot of the patterning is kind of like solidified. Okay, so as I said though, what, the, what I'm talking about today is our attempts to quantify the dorsal gradient, to measure it quantitatively using fluorescent imaging. And so just like this here embryo that you're seeing here, this cross-section uh, is a fixed embryo, which means it's been put in formaldehyde, it's been preserved, right, but it's also dead, um, but it's preserved. And you can do a lot of chemical treatments to it. And so what, what we did with this embryo is we did a uh, fluorescent immunostaining. And so that's why you can see dorsal protein fluorescently. And this is what's known as an in-situ hybridization. You can see where, which cells have R certain RNA molecules fluorescently. So we took, we took embryos and we fixed them in formaldehyde and we um, imaged them. We, we stained them for dorsal and for nuclei and for maybe an RNA molecule. And we imaged them on what's known as a confocal microscope. And so this is like our, our earliest attempt to, to measure the dorsal gradient. And the problem was we're trying to measure this in, in something that's not a cross section. Okay, so above, you know, over here you see cross sections, right? These guys are cross sections. And so you can plop the embryo down in cross-section on the microscope, and you can image the whole dorsal ventral axis right at once. And so you can get the entire view of what the dorsal gradient looks like all at once. Um, but that's not the easiest thing to do. Uh, and the reason why is because uh, naturally, so the embryo, just because of, of geometry uh, considerations, the embryo naturally lies flat. Right, you put an embryo on a microscope slide, which is a glass, you know, a flat piece of glass, and the embryo kind of lies, naturally lies flat. Um, and so you, it's not easy to image the cross-section of an embryo. Okay, so we were imaging this, this, um, these embryos in what's known as whole mount, right? So they're lying flat on the microscope slide. And so, um, but we want to do imaging, but the problem is, the other problem is that imaging deep into tissue causes light scattering. So the deeper we imaged into the embryo, the more signal loss that, that happened because the, the, the photons that have to make it out of the, the microscope objective have, has to pass through many layers of tissue to excite the fluorophore, which then fluoresces, and then the microscope objective has to pick that up, and that, and that fluorescence has to go back through many layers of tissue before it gets back to the, the microscope objective to be detected by the microscope. And so you have a lot of, lot of um, loss of light that going into and out of the tissue. So you have light scattering, you have uh, signal loss, right? And the, the final issue with, with me measuring the dorsal gradient is that what we want to do is we want to measure, or we need to measure, so you need to measure nuclear concentration of dorsal, not cytoplasmic. Because dorsal is a protein that goes into the nucleus, and it has a nuclear gradient, which means what you care about is the nuclear concentration of dorsal and not the cytoplasmic concentration. Now, it's okay if you, if you measure the cytoplasmic concentration too, that's fine, but you really need to be able to separate the nuclear parts of, of your image from the cytoplasmic parts. Okay, so we did this imaging with a, a microscope called a confocal microscope. And confocal microscopes are great because what they do is they, um, they allow you to get a nice, clean, crisp, 
optical section of your specimen. Uh, because when, if you're just imaging a, a thick specimen on your microscope slide, then there's a whole lot of light that comes from out of focus parts of the specimen that make your image blurry. And what confocal microscopes do is they are able to, with a, a slick way of, of having a little teeny pinhole for the light to pass through, it, it rejects the out of focus light. And so you get this nice, clean, crisp image. Unfortunately, you're also throwing away 90% of, of, the, of the light that you're using to, to expose the embryo to. Um, but that's just the way it goes. Okay, so um, I just wanted to uh, show you an example of what's known as a Z-stack. Okay, so what you can do with your confocal microscopes is as you're imaging a, uh, a thick specimen, you can image one confocal section, one nice little optical section. It's very clean, very crisp. And then you move the microscope stage slightly, and then you image another optical section in a different uh, Z-axis coordinate value. And you move your microscope stage again, and you can image another section of your specimen. And you can do that over and over again until you build up like kind of a, a volume, or what's known as a Z-stack, of sections of your, of your embryo. Okay, so this is what that looks like uh, right here. So right now what I'm doing is I'm showing many different Z slices in succession. Uh, the image that you see on the left here, this is uh, nuclei. So this embryo has been stained for three different things. It's been stained for nuclei. It's been stained for dorsal, which is here in the middle image. And then also this is an RNA molecule called VND. This is one of those type 2 uh, genes. So you can see all these nuclei. And as, the, um, as we go deeper and deeper into the Z slices, you first see the surface of the embryo, and then you start to see these um, what are known as sagittal sections of the embryo. Similarly for dorsal, you can see the dorsal gradient is down here. This is the, the, the ventral side of the embryo. And in other parts of the embryo, you see the absence of dorsal. And here you see RNA, and the RNA is really in a stripe down here on this part of the embryo. So we have these Z-stacks, right? Um, we can only go about halfway through the embryo because if you go too far through the embryo, then you get uh, too much signal-to-noise loss or too much signal loss, right? So you can only go about halfway through the embryo. As you start to go, you know, you're imaging kind of down through the embryo and the embryo is kind of shaped like this as far as like the microscope objective is concerned coming from above. And once you get halfway through the embryo, you start to have to go through way too much tissue to get to, to be able to image the other side, the side that's furthest away from the objective. It's actually like this, the objective is down here. Um, but I, I don't know, it's easier to think about if you think about the objective above. So the, the, you're getting these Z slices, and as, as soon as you start to get halfway through the embryo, the signal becomes too bad to really do anything with, right? So we only image halfway through the embryo. Okay, but you get these Z slices. And if you consider, you know, we're not imaging the whole embryo, and of course the embryo is kind of football shaped, right? But to a certain approximation, it looks a little bit like a cylinder, right? At least in the center of the embryo. So imagine a cylinder like this, and you're imaging this way. And what you're getting is you're getting the top half of a cylinder. If I take that top half of the cylinder and I rotate it in space, so now you're looking down the barrel of the cylinder, it looks kind of like this image that we see here. This is what's known as a YZ section. So this image that you're looking at here um, has a fixed X coordinate. And you have your Z axis going this way. And you have your Y axis going that way. As a fixed X coordinate. So this image would take place like, for example, at one particular slice, say right there, in, in this image of, of nuclei. Something like that. And what we did with our YZ section is we were able to detect the boundary of this section in yellow. So this is like the, the edge of the embryo here and yet that we were able to, to find, to determine uh, computationally. And then we said, all right, we're going to take this yellow boundary and we're going to move it in by about, I don't remember, like 30 to 50 microns or something like that. And that gave us this sort of inner boundary in blue. And each one of these points then, uh, groups of four points, gave us these quadrilaterals that were slightly trapezoidal-like shaped. I'm going to exaggerate this, but look, you know, you can see it here in this white quadrilateral here. But it, from an exaggerated point of view, it kind of looks like this. 
where I've, I've, like I said, really exaggerated these slopes. So this is like not a rectangle. That you have a, these two sides here are slightly sloped. And then what we can do is we can do a, what's known as a keystone transformation, and we can change this strip of nuclei, which are curved in space, and we can convert them into a, a, a linear strip, like this, right? So we, um, so after doing the z-stack imaging and detecting the boundary and doing all the things that we that I just said, then we unrolled, so to speak, unrolled the embryo to make a straight line of nuclei. Okay, and so this quadrilateral, which was kind of trapezoidal shaped, turns into a rectangle. So once we did that, now we have, we have this strip of nuclei, and we can do that for every single x-coordinate in our z-stack. And now we have this kind of, this thick, kind of rectangular prism of nuclei, or of, of, of the nuclear layer. And if we look down on that, then we get what looks like kind of this nice 2D sheet of nuclei. Right, so basically what we're doing is we're exchanging something which in three dimensions looks like this, and we've flattened it out. We've unrolled it and flattened it out. Like now we have like a 2D sheet of nuclei, which you see over here on the right. Okay, so if I go back to this PowerPoint uh, presentation where you were, we were kind of looking at the Z stacks uh, as they kind of stepped through in different Z positions, uh, the next slide here is actually what these images look like after we unrolled them. Right, so you have all these, you have an image of a bunch of nuclei. You have an image of the dorsal gradient where the, um, the ventral midline is somewhere right about here. That's the, the peak of the dorsal gradient. Maybe it's a little bit further towards the periphery of the image. I could be drawing that in slightly the wrong place. And then now also you have, um, you can very clearly see the boundary of this type 2 gene V and D. Right, so this is type 2 gene V and D. And the, re the reason why I say that maybe the ventral midline is, is further down is because V and D is a little bit further away from the ventral midline, so maybe it's more like down here, right? It's hard to tell uh, just by eye eyeballing it. Okay, so now we have these unrolled images, and what do we want to do with them? Well, remember, um, part of the problem, there, there are two, main, two other problems, besides the fact that the embryo naturally lies flat, which we kind of uh, uh, fixed by unrolling the images and, and flattening it out, right? And so now we can kind of clearly see uh, a, a large portion of the dorsal ventral axis, only, actually only half, right? Because we were only imaged halfway through the embryo. Uh, we can see a lot of the dorsal ventral axis. Um, but again, the problem, there are these other two problems. One is that we have light scattering. And so as you go deeper into the embryo, the, the dorsal gradient uh, gets affected because something that you think is not very bright anymore might actually be the peak of the dorsal gradient. But you can't tell that because of all the light scattering, right? You've lost signal. And so you can't really tell exactly what the gradient looks like if you have, on top of the gradient shape itself, you have um, signal loss, okay? And the other one is, again, nuclear concentration. We want nuclear, not cytoplasmic. And so it turns out that imaging the nuclei solved both of those problems. So um, this image of the nuclei that I'm showing here over to the right, I have this nice little square in the center of it. That's because those are the, 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 that's the brightest part of the image. It's the part of the image that's closest to the microscope objective. It's per, most of these nuclei haven't really experienced much signal, signal loss at this point, right? And so because of that, because they are the brightest, they are the easiest to segment. And what do we mean by segment? Um, so segmentation in, in image analysis terms is basically it means detecting different objects. So if you want to segment the nuclei, that means taking your, your image and computationally figuring out which pixels in the image correspond to nuclei and which don't. Okay, so because they could be segmented easily, they could in particular be segmented easily without knowing the embryo's age. Because we're dealing with five different nuclear cycles here. We're dealing with nuclear cycles 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. And each one of those nuclear cycles has a different nuclear density. 
because in nuclear cycle 10, you have a certain nuclear density, and then nuclear cycle 11, the nuclei have divided, and now you have double the number of nuclei, right? And then 12 and 13 and 14, you keep doubling the number of nuclei. And so, um, the, uh, what, what you really want to be able to do is you want to be able to tell how old the embryo is, somehow, because that will tell you different methods to segment the nuclei, okay? But the, the nuclei in the middle, because they're so bright, they're easy to segment just without knowing the embryo's age. So figuring out the segmentation of the nuclei in the center of the embryo helps you calculate the nuclear density, which then will help you calculate the embryo's age because the, the log base 2 of the nuclear density uh, for nuclear cycle 10 is smaller than for nuclear cycle 11, which is smaller than nuclear cycle 12, 13, and 14. And each one of these nuclei separate nicely, sorry, nuclear stages, nuclear cycles, separates nicely into bins, one integer apart, when you take the log base 2 of the nuclear density. Right, so every time you double the number of nuclei, you go up in your log base 2 by one integer value. Okay, so now we are able to tell the embryo's age. And now after that, you can use, we can use um, a little bit more sophisticated methods to segment the entire nuclei across the entire image. Okay. So imagine now we've, we've segmented the nuclei across the entire image, because now we know that this is nuclear cycle 13, and there are certain methods, you know, in our code that says if nuclear cycle 13, then use these methods to segment the whole image. Okay. So now we've segmented all the nuclei in the image, and we've converted, and this is what this looks like here, and now, then we also can convert the image into this sort of fuzzy, blurry image of nuclear intensity. Right, so these are the brightest nuclei in the center. These are the dimmest ones on the side. So identifying the nuclei um, allowed us to do two things. One, we can distinguish between nuclear versus cytoplasmic dorsal. Because we know where the nuclei are, and where the nuclei are not, that's the cytoplasm. So we say, all right, we, we know where the nuclei are, so we know when we make a measurement in the, the cor same corresponding pixels, but in the channel where we've detected the dorsal gradient, now we know what part of the, that channel is nuclear versus cytoplasmic. And the final important thing about segmenting the nuclei is you can get an internal measurement of light scattering. So you know where the nuclei are, you know how bright they are, at least in your image, and then as you go further away from the center of the image, you start to get dimmer and dimmer nuclei. Well, the nuclei are supposed to have the same brightness everywhere, and so if you get further away and you get dimmer and dimmer nuclei, that means that as you go further away in the dorsal gradient and get dimmer and dimmer nuclei there, it's, you know exactly how much of that dimness is being caused by light scattering. Okay, and so that's what this sort of fuzzy image here is. This is sort of a normalization image, which will allow us to determine, oops, hold on, which will allow us to determine um, how much light we're losing in both the red channel, which is where the nuclei are, and the green channel, which is where the dorsal gradient is. So this is sort of like a way to normalize uh, for that light scattering, for that loss. Okay, so all that's sort of set up to give you kind of methods behind like why uh, we did what we did, or how we did what we did. Um, but the upshot is, what we want to do is we want to measure the dorsal gradient. So now we have all these methods to segment the nuclei, to normalize for the light scattering, uh, and now we can actually measure the dorsal gradient in about half the embryo, right? So half of the DV axis. Okay, so you've seen this image before, but here is uh, a plot of the dorsal gradient that we've measured in, with these methods. Okay, so you have the dorsal gradient looks kind of bell-shaped um, if you take an average of all these different nuclei. Um, it's kind of bell-shaped. And we also measure different mRNA um, 
In this particular case, uh, we measured, in this particular embryo, we measured SOG. But what was interesting, and the reason why I'm showing SOG here, is that the SOG boundary is right here, right, if you take about half max. But this is the region of the embryo where the dorsal gradient has become flat, right, as, as we covered uh, before. So that's, what, that's a problem. Um, so the question is, how does dorsal place these boundaries past this position, right? Uh, so this is one of the problems. So how does dorsal place boundaries past 40% dv coordinate? The other issue we had is we, um, we measured the dorsal gradient in many different embryos uh, from several different nuclear cycles. In fact, if you scroll up, I tell you exactly how many embryos from which nuclear cycle we measured, right? So we had seven embryos measured in nuclear cycle 10, three, four, seven, and then 35. Uh, this one was the biggest because it's the longest nuclear cycle. It's easiest to just, if you're randomly picking, it's easiest to get a nuclear cycle 14 embryo. Okay, but back to, back to this problem. The other problem that we had is um, when we did these measurements, and we were very careful to try to make sure that our measurements were from uh, embryo to embryo and from day to day were done in the exact same way, so that if I image a certain brightness embryo in one day, that correspond to the same, uh, you would see the same brightness if you image the same embryo a different day, right? Which means that uh, supposedly from embryo to embryo and from day to day, the brightness that we measured somehow corresponded to the dorsal concentration. And it wasn't like, you know, a brightness of 200 one day corresponded to 100 nanomolar of dorsal, and a brightness of 200 another day corresponded to a concentration of dorsal of like 150 nanomolar. Supposedly, these were, were able to match up. The problem was, when we plotted all the gradients on top of each other from all the different nuclear cycles and all the different embryos, they were all over the place. I mean, they still had the same shape, roughly, which you can tell over here because we normalized them against each other. From, or normalize them to, from 0 to 1, and they kind of all had the same shape. But the amplitudes were all over the place. Like, for example, take nuclear cycle 14, which is here in red. These um, amplitudes range from anywhere from really low down here to really tall up here. Furthermore, even some embryos didn't kind of flatten out at the same level. So a lot of the embryos, they flattened out at, the, at, at kind of low levels down here, but some of them still flattened out at very high levels. So what was going on here? Um, so that was another question is, why do the gradient amplitudes and basal levels vary so much? Okay, so one possibility that we thought was, at least for the first question, right? So we're tackling the first question right now. How does it place a boundary this far out when it's roughly flat in that region of the embryo? And the first idea we had was, well, maybe, maybe during nuclear cycle 10 or 11 or 12 or 13, some earlier nuclear cycle before this one, which is nuclear cycle 14, maybe the earlier nuclear cycles had a broader dorsal gradient. So it delivered the spatial information early on, and the nuclei just remembered. So even though this nuclear cycle 14 gradient isn't very wide, and doesn't appear wide enough to place this boundary, maybe the nuclear cycle 13 gradient was like this. Maybe. Right? So that was a hypothesis. Unfortunately, just from kind of looking at our data here, and then normalizing the gradients on top of each other, they kind of all look the same broadness, roughly. Roughly, right? It doesn't look like there's anything that's like systematically broader at earlier ages. And in fact, that was true, right? So when we measured the width of the dorsal gradient, didn't matter what nuclear cycle we looked at, the, width, the widths were all the same. Roughly, right? I mean, these things are you know, they got experimental er error on them, right? But there's no clear trend of, like, an earlier width is, is bigger than a later width. Like, it doesn't go down like that, where, you know, the dorsal gradient at an earlier time point was able to specify SOG, and the nuclei I just remembered. Right? So but th this sort of begs the question of, like, how do we actually measure this, this dorsal gradient width? And so because it looked kind of like a Gaussian, like this, and what we did is we fit the dorsal gradient to a Gaussian-like curve, where you have the gradient amplitude here, you have the basal levels, which is basically how far above zero is the gradient tail. We had the ventral midline, which we were able to detect this way, which is not that interesting of a parameter, but 
I mean, it's there. It's, it's kind of an arbitrary parameter. Um, but the gradient width is what we're concerned with, which is, has to do with this width parameter here in the middle of this Gaussian-like um, curve equation. And so this is kind of consistently how we're, we're um, talking about the width of the dorsal gradient. And every single time uh, we measured the dorsal gradient, the width was kind of within the same range, didn't matter the age, there was no trend, right? However, there was a trend in amplitude and in basal levels. So earlier amplitudes, like nuclear cycles 10 and 11, were on average lower than later amplitudes. And nuclear cycle 14, on average, had the greatest amplitude, but also the greatest variability in the measurement that we had. Furthermore, the basal levels, like how far this gradient tail was above zero, uh, started higher and then over time gone, went on average lower. So that told us a couple things. One is that because there's a clear trend from nuclear cycle to nuclear cycle, it told us that, there's, that this variability that we see isn't just us being bad at measuring. This, is, this actually might be real, because there's actu an actual trend that we can see in real life <laughs> as, as we bend the, the embryos in, by age. Okay? It, could, it still could be us bad, being bad. But it, it wasn't, this, this lent more credence to the idea that what's happening actually is when we, um, when we measure the dorsal gradient, because the dorsal gradient changes in time so much, and we're just imaging a, a snapshot of this dynamic process, that during nuclear cycle 14, maybe it starts low and gets high, like that. And so if you are randomly fixing and imaging embryos from different time points in nuclear cycle 14, you're going to see different gradient amplitudes. And that explains why we had so much variability in our data. Now, I should say that this wasn't entirely our idea. Our, our idea. And, and I apologize, I didn't actually put this reference uh, in, in, the, um, in the lecture notes, so I'm going to have to write it down here. But it's Delato et al. 2007 in the journal Development. And what they did is they actually had a, this, this GFP tag dorsal. So they were looking in live embryos. So they were actually able to see, uh, image some nuclei over time. And they saw that actually the dorsal gradient does change like this over time. They didn't actually take the next step, which is to quantify it. They just kind of looked at images and said, hey, look, it looks brighter. Um, they did some quantification. Um, but mostly they just sort of did it a little bit quick and dirty. And they said, hey, look the dorsal gradient does grow over time. So that lent, that was kind of what helped us formulate this idea. And the fact that we are seeing these trends from nuclear cycle to nuclear cycle told us, yeah, we're probably on the right track. This is real, um, right? And so what, what we saw, again, in, in general, is we saw that the gradient amplitude was always Increasing. The basal levels were always decreasing. And the width stayed constant. So these first two points kind of answered the question of why do the gradient amplitudes and basal levels vary so much? It's because they really do, right? It wasn't just they varied because we were bad at doing experiments and doing me careful measurements. Our measurements were likely correct, but, you know, plus or minus some error bars. Um, but they varied so much in our data because they actually really were changing in real time in the embryos. But the fact that the width stayed constant opened up this question which is still, how does dor the dorsal gradient place boundaries past the 40% dv coordinate? Um, this paper here, where I said they image the dorsal GFP, I should write that down, dorsal GFP paper. This is the first dorsal GFP paper that came out ever. Um, they didn't bother measuring the width of the dorsal gradient. Furthermore, it turned out that this particular dorsal GFP construct really messed up the width of the dorsal gradient as well. In fact, if you looked at this dorsal GFP construct, and if you did measure the width, scroll back up, you would conclude, because the dorsal gradient would be broader in those embryos. Of course, that would push the SOG boundary out further. Um, so it's kind of like, you know, kicking the, the problem back one more step. 
Um, but if you didn't look at the, at the SOG profile in those embryos, and you just looked at the gradient, you would say, no, the gradient is broad. What are you guys talking about? Okay, but it's the, it was the GFP attached to dorsal that kind of made that uh, happen. Okay, so we still have this problem. Like, how does SOG, um, how does dorsal place this boundary, these kinds of boundaries way out here? SOG, DPP, which is even further out, right? And, and, but our fixed imaging data here that we did in this paper, um, it left open the door for, for one particular interpretation, which was the possibility that as you look at this uh, these dorsal gradient width measurements, that they're, they're not super tight. Right? They have some, some error to them. Right? And some, some measurements in nuclear cycle 10 were down here, and some were up here. And so the question is, um, even though on average, there's no trend from nuclear cycle to nuclear cycle. Maybe within a nuclear cycle, it starts broad and then becomes narrow. And it broadens again at the next nuclear cycle, becomes narrow again. And so maybe it's possible if we caught the right snapshot, we would see a broad enough dorsal gradient that might explain how SOG boundaries or type 3 boundaries could be placed by the dorsal gradient. Okay? So that's the next thing we wanted to do was a few years later, we actually did the same kinds of um, measurements, but now we're doing them in live imaging uh, with, a, uh, with a live embryo uh, with a GFP tagged dorsal. It's actually a yellow fluorescent protein, not green fluorescent protein. Um, and this particular yellow fluorescent protein is called Venus. Okay, so <clears throat> this is what we're seeing here. So we have, um, we're using, in this, in this paper we were using dorsal tagged with Venus in optical cross-sections. So now we're not worried about like doing Z-stacks and then rolling the embryo and doing all these different um, computational image analysis tricks to be able to get the dorsal gradient quantified. Now we're just looking at a, at a snapshot, not, not a snapshot, we're looking at the entire DV axis in one image, right? And because it's a live embryo, we could watch that embryo develop from nuclear cycle 11 to 12 to 13 to 14. So this is what it looks like. So you're looking at an, a live embryo with Venus uh, attached to dorsal. So the dorsal gradient's down here. The, um, the quantification of the dorsal gradient that you're seeing in real time is like this. And there's gastrulation where you start to have all the cells migrate on top of each other in a complex fashion. You can see, again, with the different nuclear cycles, the gradient appears and it disappears, and then it reappears. And it goes through these nuclear cycles where every time the nuclei divide, the barrier between nucleus and cytoplasm disappears, and, so, and then you have mixing of, of dorsal venous around, and so the gradient disappears. On average, we saw that nuclear cycle 11 gradients were lower than nuclear cycle 12, than nuclear cycle 13, then 14. But if we plotted over time the amplitude and plotted over time the basal levels, then we get what we see here in this graph. So the, the amplitude grows, during nuclear cycle 11 interphase, and then during mitosis it collapses because there's, again, no barrier uh, to separate nucleus from cytoplasm. And then nuclear cycle 12 it grows and collapses. And then nuclear cycle 13 it grows and collapses. And then nuclear cycle 14 it grows again. And so you can see this is exactly what we were, were predicting with our previous paper, which is that if you look at, if you take different snapshots of different fixed embryos, you will see very different amplitudes of the dorsal gradient, depending on what time that embryo was fixed was put into formaldehyde at. Furthermore, um, in addition to plotting the amplitude in the basal levels versus time, we also plotted the width versus time. And what we saw is that this width is perfectly constant. It's not like, it, it was constant from nuclear cycle to the nuclear cycle, but it also is constant within a nuclear cycle. It's not like the width, again, started broad and became narrow. It didn't do that. It stayed constant the entire time which again raised the question of how does this fairly narrow dorsal gradient specify domains that are really far away from the, um, the part of the dorsal gradient where you expect it to have enough slope to specify domain. So th that's the first thing that happened is that we, we did this imaging and we found out, yes, indeed, this is exactly what we predicted with our fixed embryo imaging. Just now we have um, a, a, a better data about it, right? Because we can look at a single embryo and watch it happen, watch it develop in real time, right? So live imaging, confirmed and extended our fixed imaging 
results. However, fixed imaging still gave better signal to noise ratio. Furthermore, furthermore, um, we adopted methods, we, we were able to adopt methods and perfect methods to actually image cross sections of fixed embryos now. Whereas before we were imaging these kind of uh, whole mount Z stacks, and you had to do all these computational techniques to unroll the embryo, blah, blah, blah. We started to, and I say like, oh, we perfected the technique. We really just took a razor blade and then like sliced the embryos up into cross sections and then like image them that way. Um, but it, at first we were like, can we even do that? Like, do I even have the hand-eye coordination to do that on these like half a millimeter size embryos? And the answer is yes. You know, you can get used to it with a microscope. You can do it. Um, so we started imaging cross sections. So we imaged hundreds of cross sections. Or maybe like 150, I don't remember. Um, and uh, if we plot all the nuclear cycle 14 cross sections normalized on top of each other, what we see um, that we couldn't see with live imaging, and we couldn't see with our Z-stack whole mount unrolling imaging, is we saw that the, the gradient actually has this Gaussian-like behavior, like we were saying before, but there's also this tail, right? So fixed imaging showed a slight downward slope to the tail. To the gradient tail, there's a slight downward slope. And you can measure that slope. Um, you can just pretend like this is a line. I just fit y equals mx plus b to it, and you can measure the slope. And the slope, on average, um, was less than zero. So here's zero. And some actually, some curved up, actually. Some dorsal gradients went like this. And surely that could be, you know, experimental error, right? We just, like, didn't measure that embryo very well or whatever, right? But on average, the slope was less than zero, right? That's this blue bar here, which is the, the most, the, the average, or maybe the most frequent, or I forget what we did. Um, on average, it was less than zero. Um, you can definitely tell that from this average curve here in red. <clears throat> there definitely is a downward slope to this gradient tail, which means if there's a downward slope, then there's still positional information that the, gr that the morphogen gradient is delivering, even in the, in the part of the gradient where you think it becomes flat. There's some small amount of positional information. The question became, is this enough positional information to place boundaries? And if you remember back to when we talked about um, uh, the question of like noise slash transition width slash cell size constraint a couple weeks ago, one of the big questions was, what is the difference in concentration of the morphogen between two nuclei? And then comparing that to the, to nu the nucleus's ability to measure the precision with which the, the nucleus could measure the co morphogen concentration. So the question is, could this tail explain the positioning of some of these type 3 genes? And the answer is no. The answer is no. Um, no, because, I mean, it does it, it does it better than something that's completely flat. But it's no because um, if you look at, so here's the SOG domain, right? This is roughly where SOG is expressed. And if you look at where... Um, the difference between the dorsal gradient between two adjacent nuclei, if you have a tail versus not, it's like minuscule differences between each other, but also the difference in concentration between two neighboring nuclei is about like 0.7%. Remember the gold standard that we were talking about before was a 10% difference. And there's not even a 10% difference anywhere in this dorsal gradient. The best you get is like right at the snail boundary, right at this type 1 boundary, you get almost 10% difference between nuclei. So no, it does not, because the difference between nuclei is less than 1% of dorsal concentration. There's, there's just not enough gradient slope there to do anything. 
All right, so we've got about four minutes left, so here's the kicker. Okay, um, so this, well, hold on, let me just write this down. So therefore, the transition width, which we had previously been calling delta x, is huge. And you can actually plot um, error bars here in the, in the x direction. And if there's any error in a cell's ability to measure the dorsal gradient here, then the error bar <laughs> goes all the way out to the, to the dorsal midline. There's just not enough, for, you, can't, you have to have like really incredible, incredible precision to be able to measure, um, to be able to place a boundary there with this kind of really weak slope. Okay, so here's the kicker. Um, let me scroll back up to where I was looking at the type 1, type 2, and type 3 domains. Actually, first, uh, let's note here that this is the type 1 boundary, right? The type 1 boundary is right here, right at the peak of, of where you have the most difference between two nuclei and the dorsal gradient, okay? Uh, this is really weak out here. This is the type 3 boundary way out here, right? This is horrible. And then right about here, this is the type 2 boundary. And that's more than, it's between 5 and 6% difference between nuclei. So it's not great, but it's okay, right? So it turns out that, um, that here, at the, the boundary of the type 1 domain, where like snail is expressed, really close to 10%, that translates into uh, a transition width of about one cell. And right here, at the type 2 boundary, translates into a transition width of about two to three cells. And right here, the type three boundary, it translates into a transition width of like 100 cells or something. And it was like 13, 10 to 13 cells. I don't know, 20, 50, I don't know, somewhere, in, it's, it's huge, right? Okay, so as you get further away from the ventral midline, the transition width gets worse. Well, we've seen that before anyway, right? We know that, we know that to be true. Um, even Bitcoin does that, right? But let's let's go back and look up at the, at the, um, at the quantification of all these gene expression domains that I had in the very first page of the notes here. Look at these different boundaries that we see. Experimentally, when we measure them, look at the different boundaries. Which one is the sharpest? The type 1 boundary is the sharpest. It has, it experimentally has the, the narrowest transition width. The type 2 boundary is also sharp, but it's not quite as sharp, right? There is some slope to that boundary. And so what we're seeing is we're seeing experimentally, yes, the dorsal gradient does not have the ability to give a one cell transition with to every single gene expression boundary it places. However, we don't even see that experimentally, right? Even the embryo doesn't seem to care that the transition width for SOG is like five to seven cell, cell boundaries, cell diameters. And the transition width for DPP is something that's similar, right? Several, five, 10, I don't know, cell boundaries, cell diameters. And so at some level, some of these gene expression boundaries are important to have a narrow transition width, and those just happen to be the ones that are closest to the ventral midline, which just happen to be the ones that the dorsal gradient is able to give a, a good transition width for. But then you have these other boundaries, which the embryo maybe doesn't care as much about. It doesn't have to be on-off for these genes. And those happen to be the ones that are further away where the dorsal gradient can't place a good transition width. And that's fine, right? The embryo deals with that. That's what it is. Um, last thing to say, um, at the very end of the notes here, I have a bunch of uh, other type 3 genes that are imaged. So you have SOG here, which I already shown you, another one called FISB. This one call is called, I forget, and it's too hard to see, NU3. And this one's called ZEN. And, each, and this is a, a type 3 minus gene, obviously. And each one of these has a very, very broad uh, transition width. Okay. Now, I I'm going to leave you th with this. Um, with that thought, but let me just say, uh, as we transition into the next lecture, um, even so, the dorsal gradient still isn't good enough to place these boundaries, um, even even the way they are they are here. Um, and so, as we transition into the next lecture, we'll see a little bit more um, what else might be happening that allows the dorsal gradient to place these boundaries far away from the ventral midline. Okay, so that's the official end of the lecture. But I do have a question here. Right, that's a good question. So the question is, why are we assuming that the dorsal gradient is by itself in placing these boundaries? Maybe there's some other morphogen, some other source of positional information that is somehow able to, to, to let these boundaries be placed. 
And the answer is, as far as we know, dorsal is the only thing that has positional information uh, at th in this time in the embryo. And everything else that has positional information is because they get it from dorsal. Right, so, so it's possible there's, like, so what you said here is it's possible there's a signaling cascade, it's sort of a relay, where dorsal has some amount of positional information, it specifies it's some rough boundary, and there's some other, and that turns on some other signaling pathway that has a, a better, um, uh, more positional information that, that appears. Uh, and so with this sort of relay, you're able to ref, uh, start out with rough boundaries and then refine them over time. And that might be part of what's happening. Um, you have a really narrow time window for that, though, here. Um, in nuclear cycle 14, it's 45 minutes. Transcriptional and translational delays are long enough that it's really hard to get much more than uh, maybe one or two steps in that relay. I mean, the gap genes kind of do it a little bit, right? Um, so, but the question is, can dorsal do this by itself? If not, what other relays are there that, that could be doing this? Um, and we talk about that a little bit in the paper, but that's, that can't explain everything. So not all, like for example, DPP seems to appear, uh, and Zen, uh, at least at this stage, appear to be only dependent on dorsal. So there is some part of this where dorsal has to be the one delivering all the information. Um, and it doesn't seem to be able to do it on its own. And, and But we'll talk more about that next time. And I think we have a little bit more of an answer now. Yeah, so the question is, is the noise because the, there's actually is variability in the system, or is it because uh, the imaging isn't that good? And the answer is the imaging. Uh, because you can do the fixed imaging, you can see that the variability is not there. Uh, the live imaging, you're always having to, to there are these trade-offs between um, spatial, temporal, and concentration scales, uh, where if you try to get better signal, a con better concentration scale, then you're going to have to give up some spatial resolution or some temporal le resolution. And so you're trying to, to balance all of these so you get a good enough set of time points with high enough spatial resolution that you can actually see events um, without giving up too much signal-to-noise ratio. Um, and so that's sort of where the balance was, and we did the best we could.